Hey, good morning, Spain, and good morning, uh, TES Summit. This is uh, Joe Burton coming to you from the United States, currently in uh, New York, actually in Buffalo, New York, of all places. And today we're going to talk about native marketing. Um, first and foremost, thank you to the TES team for having me on board for this. Um, I really do enjoy giving lectures and talks about native and kind of how it's impacted my personal life and my business. Wish we could do this in person and hopefully, you know, as things continue to kind of get back to normal in this world, this will be one of the last few times we have to do a virtual summit. So again, a little background on me. Um, my name is Joe Burton. I'm the owner of an agency called ROI Marketplace. So we do a lot of things, but really our claim to fame has been to been, you know, the top native marketing agency on the planet, in my opinion. Um, there's a lot of things we can do as a company, a lot of agencies out there that specialize in YouTube and Facebook and search and display and email and so on. But we've kind of carved out native as our specialty. Um, I've been in this business for well over 15 years, um, most of which have been built around native marketing at some capacity. And today we're going to do about a 30 to 35 minute talk. We're going to go over history of native, current trends of native, where native is going. We're going to discuss how to launch campaigns, why it's beneficial, and ultimately how to manage and, you know, and, and do some media buying as well. Um, there'll be a, probably a 15 to 20 minute Q&A session at the end of this, so I urge you highly to Write down any questions, comments, or concerns you may have, and we'll discuss them, you know, once the time is ready. So what is native marketing? Um, this is a definition that I personally have, but I consider native marketing to be a direct connection between a brand and their consumers where they can tell their story, right? And this is going to be a lot different than maybe the people that are buying on Amazon or buying on Google or even buying on email or even Facebook, right? Um, these platforms are all geared towards a different, you know, part of that consumer's daily routine. On search, they're actively looking for your product. On email, maybe you're following up or you're emailing them about a product based on some list they've signed up for. Um, Facebook is a social media site where obviously people are engaged with the content there and in my opinion are engaged to be shopping for you know things to kind of meet their audience behavior. So a native is more news-based and more first touch based. Um, it's a lot different, but it's also a very important piece of any good marketing strategy. And we're gonna cover why, in my opinion, every brand and every person buying media on this planet should have budget set aside for their native campaign. Uh, so brief history on native. Um, I think it's important to cover where it's been, to know where it's going. Um, in the kind of 1990s, paid search started to really kind of become a big thing in the world. Um, that was through obviously display search and many different forms of media, you know, obviously display and content-based search and just obviously tier two, tier three, and tier one search platforms. In the mid 2000s, um, 2006 or so, content recommendation was born. This was kind of what was the very early adopters of what is considered to be now native marketing. And this is basically just content built into new sites that was different from the display inventory. The company I was with at the time was called Pulse360, and they basically you know, were the first adopters that found out this was a great form of media for publishers. So obviously sites like, you know, ESPN and CNN and, you know, various news sites around the globe, this is mostly free content that you can go and visit to read articles on. Well, obviously they have to make their money from the advertising side of things. And up until kind of native became the big thing, they did it almost all entirely on display marketing. Now display was great, but it had, you know, various CPM rates and the barriers for entry were super high. Essentially what you had to do was call up MSN, negotiate a CPM rate for a 300 by 250, get your content approved and then get a budget in place. The budgets were always pretty high from a minimum standpoint. And it really only allowed, you know, top tier advertisers or top budget advertisers to be able to buy that media. We found that we could add a small little widget to the bottom of a news site like MSNBC was where these were, for example, and it actually allowed for A, MSNBC to make additional revenue, and B, it allowed for new advertisers to get on those platforms that maybe couldn't do it in the past. So from the text-based advertising, we found that, you know, A, this added new and incremental money back to MSNBC's pocket, which then grew into, of course, you know, a better relationship for them long-term. The next kind of step in this was adding images to the content. Um, obviously, everything a website does is based on a CPM or you know, cost per thousand. So by adding little images to our websites like this, we found that greatly increased our, <coughs> our click-through rates. Higher click-through rates and higher conversion rates meant higher bids, which meant more revenue for the publishers, which, of course, they embraced mightily. It's evolved ever since then into additional in-feed net platforms. Now you really can't go to a news site without seeing 
an ed feed or a right rail or a bottom rail or some kind of native placement throughout the site. They're almost so integrated with the content of the site now you can't even differentiate a news article versus a content feed. All right, so where's native going? Um, native marketing is expected to surpass $57 billion in 2021. This is a $57 billion industry. So we're not talking about small potatoes here. This is a worldwide major, major you know, form of marketing. I don't think you can find many publications or news sites in the world that not have some kind of native ads on there. Um, it is quickly replacing display as the premier placements on almost all you know, platforms across the world. Um, there's innovations happening all the time, mobile innovations, in-stream applications, native video content is exploding. So all these things lead you to believe that if you don't have some kind of budget set aside for a native strategy, then you're gonna find yourself behind the times very quickly. Again, I cover this a little more detail, but you know, people really do engage with this content. You know, they know it's an advertisement. They know they're engaging with an advertisement when they click on this app, but they still enjoy the content with it. It's a great opportunity for you to connect directly with your consumer and tell them about your product. All right, so why should you buy native? First and foremost, the unmatched reach and scale. Again, this is a $57 billion industry and you're able to really target sites throughout the entire world. You, um, it's gonna greatly enhance your social media. Things you're doing on Facebook, things you're doing on Twitter, things you're doing on other social platforms, they're gonna get better because of your strategy than native. It's got significantly higher engagement rates than traditional display marketing does. You're able to target by audience, by site. You're able to pick out, handpick sites that you wanna advertise on based on the demographics of those sites. You know, I advertise primarily in the United States, but we do do about 20% of our inventory non-US. And that's actually something we're looking to grow exponentially in, in the next couple of years. I think there's even more opportunity outside of the US because of just competition's a little bit lighter, bids are a little bit lighter, and you're able to still reach that same massive scale. Native converts and it's gonna complement everything else that you're doing online. All right, so the benefits of, a, of native campaigns for DR. I'm assuming that most of the people in this audience are probably some kind of direct response marketer. You want some kind of cost per sale, cost per lead, cost per install, cost per something. So, you know, that's the kind of campaigns that we manage daily and they do work on, on native in a huge way. So benefits of native for DR. One is gonna greatly increase your first touch clicks. You're gonna introduce your product or service or platform to many new people at a much lower barrier for entry than maybe on Facebook. While a click on Facebook, maybe you know a dollar, two dollars, three dollars, who knows, based on the CPM rates. With native, you can control that. And you're gonna be CPC's premium US, you know, 80 cents, 90 cents at the very, very high end for desktop premium sites, um, secondary sites, 30 to 40 cents, premium worldwide, definitely subpar 40 cents for massive traffic. It's going to really help you boost up your Facebook stuff. Um, I know I always make the most money on my Facebook campaigns for me marketing. And by driving in consistent new users to my remarketing funnels, I'm able to greatly increase my Facebook targeting through a much more targeted platform. It's stable. Day in and day out, my campaigns are going to be consistently driving massive scale and massive reach while helping my bottom line. And again, this is worldwide traffic. If I want to buy traffic in any country throughout the world, there's platforms out there that are gonna support me. This is kind of a joke I always throw out there because anyone that's bought native or bought media in general knows how complicated it can be, right? So native media buying is easy. You have to match the exact headline to the exact image to the right user at the right time of day on the right website while bidding in a completely live environment against a million other advertisers who are watching your every move and trying to steal your best stuff. After this, you have to deal with each individual networks who are constantly changing their rules and their regulations. And the best part is once you dial a campaign in, someone's going to try to steal your findings and I'll bid you for it. So if you've bought native at scale, you know this is kind of true. And we're going to cover some ways around this, but I always find this to be kind of humorous. All right, how to run a successful native campaign. Um, first and foremost, whether you're kind of owning your own product, whether you're an agency, whether you are marketing for a, a, a consumer, or whether you're just an affiliate pulling links from a, a CPA network, these steps are gonna hold relatively true throughout. So, you know, pay attention again, if you have any questions or comments that you might have. All right, choosing your offers. Um, first and foremost, you have to outsmart your, your competitors, right? Look for what needs are out there in the world in the marketplace right now. Um, 
2021 and 2020 are very different years. Obviously, the COVID fact or the COVID virus had a major, major impact on the world as a whole, right? And what happened was that created different needs and different channels for people looking to buy and purchase goods online. One of my favorite stories is uh, we had a client who came to us actually after this, but they sold masks online on Taboola. Actually, it was a network they were running on. Um, before COVID, you couldn't sell a mask on Taboola if you had to, right? No one was going to buy that product or service. They were very early to market. They had a great product at a very fair price. They did things very, very legitimately. And they went from having no traffic from Taboola to spending $100,000 a day worldwide on, on selling masks online. Um, they were fleeced and amazed by how much traffic was available and how many people saw and engaged with their ads on a regular basis. So again, what is the need in the world? What is the need in your community? What is the need in your market? And how can your product or service adapt to that need? Obviously, you wouldn't want to sell a heating unit in the middle of summer or an air conditioning unit in the middle of winter, right? You wouldn't want to sell you know, surfboards if there was no lake nearby. You wouldn't want to sell you know, a home-based service to people that live in apartments. So Understanding your audience, understanding the need and building campaigns around that is how you're going to outsmart your competitors and how you're going to make, you know, native be a great channel for you. This can work for almost any vertical. We do a ton with e-commerce. We do a lot with the health weighted campaigns. Financial products are absolutely huge based on shifts in the market, investment opportunities, investment advice. Lead generation is massive, massive, massive scale on, on, on native campaigns, right? Whether that's going to be insurances, home loans, refinancing your loans. Um, there's a million different opportunities there in the, in the lead generation space. And then really looking at internationally. Again, I, I said it before, but a huge goal for my company is to grow internationally in the next couple of years. I think there's a massive opportunity in an untapped market to get in you know, countries around the globe and get your campaigns. Obviously, we're in a worldwide conference right now. I know many of you people probably don't even advertise in the U.S., so you have a massive opportunity to get in front of some new audiences. All right, here's how I determine if an offer is good for native. First and foremost, does it have a good story, right? This is content-based advertising. This is content recommendation. This is basically reading like a news article or a content piece. Your content has to be on point for native to work for you. If your story is good behind a product or service, you've got a very good chance of making it work. Second point, are your clear call to actions? Do people know what they're signing up for? Is there a quick lead form submit? Is it a quick call to action for a sale of a product? Do people know why they're on the website? Um, is it not too controversial, right? You know, there's certain things on native where we've probably all seen grotesque ads and crazy things in the past. Those offers are leaving, you know, while you can be a great offer, you can't be so controversial that major publications aren't going to watch you. Can you break down your CPA into some kind of serviceable, actionable item? And what I mean by that is if you're selling a $300 product, can you put pixels up funnel to break things down based on engagement rates? Maybe it's the views of a website. Maybe it's people that make it from point A to point B in your editorial. Maybe it's people that you know submit a lead form. Are you able to break down a higher CPA based goal to smaller, inexpensive, actionable items. Does your product service a need in the community? And number, the, the last point here, and I think probably one of the best is unique offers are always gonna convert better. If you launch an offer that's exactly like 30 other people doing the exact same offer with the exact same type of ads and the exact types of placements, it's not gonna be as easy to make the campaigns profitable. We've always found internally when unique products make their way to our door, those are the campaigns that we can take from point A to point B in a much, much bigger way. So look for offers that meet this criteria that are unique. And you got a very good chance of making your campaigns work. All right. So we're going to cover now how to launch a successful campaign. And we'll do this as a whole. Um, obviously, each network's a little bit different. Each campaign's a little bit different. But, you know, we'll cover this in a general form. And we can get into more specifics during Q&A if you guys have any questions. Um, so the key number one is choosing the right offer, right? Not every offer is going to work. Not every campaign is going to work. But if you kind of listen to some of our previous points, I think you'll have a much better chance of, of making those campaigns work out of the gates. Point two here, and this is pretty important in my opinion, is doing, do your research. Don't just log into an ad sniffing tool, steal somebody's ads, throw them out there and see what happens, right? No one understand the offer. Who are your target audiences? Who are your target consumers? Who is gonna buy your product? What areas do they live in? What is their household income? What kind of people are they? 
knowing that is going to help you to write engaging content and do some audience targeting. It's going to help your campaigns be much, much, much more, you know, productive out of the gates. Next step is to create that engaging content. So I think we covered the importance behind having a great, you know, content piece and a great story to tell. This is your opportunity to really introduce that to the audience. Your piece shouldn't be too long, but it should also be able to sell people in a very, very explicit way about why they should do business with you. Usually, in my opinion, with a, with a pre-sale page, you have about 30 seconds to capture someone's attention. So when they come to your pre-sale page, they're reading about your product, they're reading about your service, you have about 30 seconds to loop them in. If they're bored in the first 30 seconds, they're gonna click off and you've lost the opportunity to do business with that person. Uh, next one's gonna be you know, choosing the right traffic source. And we'll cover this a bit more in detail, but campaigns that work on Taboola may not work on MGID or may not work on Rev Content and maybe not on Gemini. So knowing the traffic sources to test on is gonna help you to be much more successful out of the gates. And then of course, you have to launch a campaign. So how do we research our ads? Um, there's a lot of different research tools out there, things like AdBeat and What Runs Where and similar tech, and then of course, just go to Facebook, right? Um, this is gonna allow you to see what types of ads your competitors are running. So if I'm running a lead generation platform for refinancing my mortgage, I can research on some of these tools and see what my competitors are buying, what types of ads are they running, what types of platforms they're running on, what types of content are they recommending? All these things are going to help me build a campaign that's much more successful. I can't stress this enough. Don't steal people's stuff. Don't log in, take their campaigns, take their pre-sale pages and try to launch a campaign. It's probably not going to work. They probably have things a lot more dialed in than you do. But take ideas from it. Take content recommendations from it. Understand why this is working and then apply that to your own individual campaigns. So your pre-sale page. Your whole goal of your pre-sale page is to educate your consumers, right? This is your opportunity to sell your product or service to them. Um, it's very different than on Facebook, very different than on YouTube, more video-based stuff. This is more text-based stuff, right? So the easiest way to increase your ROI is to increase your engagement rates. And that's gonna be how many people read your pre-sale page and then follow on to that next step in your funnel. So you do that by having creative and engaging content that is salesy, but not over the top, right? You're not looking to ever mislead your audience and try to tell them you know, misconceptions or you know, downright lies about your service, right? Your goal here is to educate them about why they should buy from you. It's important to build your brand, make professional, good-looking pages, and think of the long-term viability of your audience, right? If you're able to develop a great content-based site, you can not only you know, make money from a client on day one, but you should be able to be consistently making money day over day over day for the lifetime of the campaign. Pre-sale page builders. Um, so we have designers in-house that are constantly flipping out new pages. There's a lot of really great pre-sale page building tools out there that allow very basic designers to make really professional looking pre-sale pages. We've used some of these in the past, and they really helped us to kind of take the campaigns, you know, quickly and adopt multiple pre-sale pages for split testing. Um, Wizzy and Elementor are probably my favorite too. ClickFunnels, that's a great platform as well. Lander Lab, and there's other ones out there also. So again, these will allow for everyday media buyers like myself, who has absolutely no, you know, no graphic design skills whatsoever, to actually make a pre-sale page that looks good. And then on top of that, I can split off and design that pre-sale page 15 different ways and help to kind of increase my engagement rates. All right, next step is obviously choosing the best traffic sources, right? So we discussed this a little bit a minute ago about, you know, not every campaign on Taboola is gonna work on content ad. So the main networks that we use that I consider tier one are gonna be Taboola, Outbrain, Gemini, and Rough Content. Um, there's other ones you can probably add to this list, but my opinion, this is who I have up as my tier one top platforms. Now, because they're a tier one, they are on some of the biggest publications in the world. Think MSN, CNN, think major news broadcasts in your, in your local region, right? They're very strict on compliance. So if your product is anywhere borderline on a compliance standpoint or aggressive, you're probably not going to get approved on Taboola. So there's other platforms out there where you can still do a lot of, you know, a lot of volume on there. MGID, Content Ad, Adblade, Nativo, Engagia are all a little bit more, you know, accepting of, of aggressive traffic. Um, <clears throat> then you can even break down like push traffic sources, right? So 
while push isn't fully native, I do consider push in the same umbrella as native marketing. So when you get into a push, a lot of things that will never get approved on Taboo or I'll bring it, are going to go ahead and get approved on, you know, Propeller or the Advertiser or Zero Park. And then, of course, there's DSPs. So a DSP is basically a trading desk where you can tie directly into almost all of these platforms through one trading desk. Now, the downside is you have to pay a little more for the traffic, but the upside is some of the targeting and some of the ways you can do it are even better targeting tactics and you can buy directly with Tabula. And then there's always direct site buys. You know, a lot of these actual websites are selling their traffic directly now. So you can simply call up MSN and say, what does it cost me to buy a native spot? And they'll give you some rates. All right, so launching a campaign. Um, and we follow these exact same practices in-house for all the campaigns that we run. So when a new client comes to us, we always start our campaigns off very slow. We pick one or two traffic sources that we think is going to work best. Um, from that, we launch on desktop only usually, unless it's, of course, a campaign that traditionally favors mobile. And we launch between 50 and 75 cents for U.S.-based traffic. International traffic varies a lot more. Um, major English-speaking geos like Australia, Canada, UK, etc., probably 30 to 60 cents. Um, smaller geos, things like Singapore, Malaysia, et cetera, can be even cheaper. Um, we ran a massive campaign in France two years ago that was, you know, basically pennies in the dollar if we pay for the U.S. So, again, international campaigns, if you have them, I highly recommend that you're focusing on them with, with some great native campaigns. You got to get all your stuff in place in terms of tracking. Um, there's great tracking platforms out there. We currently use Volume. We've also used Thrive. There's plenty of other ones out there that you can also test as well. Make sure all of your pixels are set up properly, whether you're using Postbacks or page-based pixels or whatever. Make sure your entire funnel is, is good to go. And believe it or not, we launch on low spend caps. So we have clients that have spent you know, a million dollars a month with us that we start spending $100 a day for, right? Just while we kind of dial the campaigns in. The goal here is to learn the offer, understand the offer, dial things in before you kind of go big. And I usually launch all of my campaigns with a five image and five headline exploratory basis. And then from there, we look for our controls. API versus no API. So for those of you who don't know what an API is, obviously, when you're buying a campaign on Taboola, your ads may go off to two or 300 different websites all at one time. Um, you may find your different bids for all these websites are very different from a conversion rate standpoint. You may find that many sites don't work for you. So pre-API days, you had to log into Taboola, watch your traffic sources, and manually pause things or adjust things you wanted to have happen. Increase your bids, decrease your bids, pause placements, activate placements, pause ads, all those things, right? So API is actually an automated way you can do that. Um, some of the bigger ones out there that we've worked with is the Optimizer, which is my go-to. We've also used Brax and Maximus, and we've also tested Ad Genius. And there's other ones that are not on this list. So what happens with an API is instead of you having to manually make every single adjustment, the API goes out and actually does a lot of this work for you. So instead of you looking at the campaign two hours a day, it's actually watching your campaign 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and making adjustments for you based on what you tell it to do. So I highly recommend it. I think it's critical for any kind of large scale campaigns that have an API. You can probably launch a smaller campaign without it, but when you're talking about launching, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars of ad spend, you're gonna to wanna to have some kind of API in place. Okay. All right, so now we're gonna talk about how you optimize a live campaign. So we have put some ads out there. We've got some content out there. We've got some clicks out there. How do we start to optimize these campaigns once we get traffic flowing in? A lot of points here, we won't cover them all, um, but understanding your pre-sale pages, right? There's long pre-sales and there's short pre-sales. Short pre-sales are meant to be a teaser. They get them one step further in the funnel. A long pre-sale is meant to really educate your consumer on them. Um, does your product need a VSL? A lot of people are really running VSLs heavily in the financial and health space right now. And for those that don't know what a VSL is, it's a basic, it's a video style landing page that is basically like a infomercial or a YouTube ad. Um, I've seen these things as long as an hour and a half and as short as two minutes, you know, but they're also a great way to really sell your consumers. Are you investing in the proper content, right? You know, are you investing in good ads? Are you setting realistic goals and writing volatilities in the marketplace? 
are you doing audience targeting? You know, a lot of these platforms are catching up in terms of the ability to target by audience now. You can now set demo targeting for male, female, age, income levels, household income levels, um, their user behavior online, you know, which is obviously beneficial for any campaign. And are you remarketing to these users, right? I'm amazed at how many clients I talk to that aren't doing a simple remarketing campaign to, you know, back up their display tactics. Couple of quick tips. Um, optimize by engagement first and conversion rate second. So what is your engagement rate? Your engagement rate is gonna be how many people read your editorial and then make it to the next step in your funnel. Typically speaking, we set a 20% goal for that number across all of our campaigns. Um, this can vary a lot. We've got campaigns that are 75% and campaigns that are at 5%, both of which can be profitable. You know, but 20% is kind of our minimum starting point. Are you quickly cutting sources that you don't know or are not converting? You know, there's so many sources to be bought on native side of things. You don't have to spend double your CPA and write things out to try to make a campaign work. Get some sources cut early, remove the fat, and focus on what's working early on, and then come back in and test those sources at a later point in time. Ad CTR is critical. Um, 0.20 CTR and the ads are kind of the minimum we shoot for for most of our campaigns. Are you comparing your effective bids to your effective EPCs? And that's gonna be will your CPC compare it to your earnings per click. Every site on this plan has some kind of value behind it. And your goal as a media buyer is to match up your cost per click with your earnings per click. And the better you can do that, the more profitable your campaign you're gonna be. I always live by the 80-20 rule. And what that basically means is 80% of my traffic is run on profitable campaigns, and then 20% of my traffic is run on testing. Um, it's a bit slow out of the gates when you're spending $200 a day in a client. Obviously, that 80-20 is pretty split or you know, pretty low in terms of testing budget. When you start to spend $8,000 or $80,000 a day, you know, that testing budget gets much more you know, large and much easier to work with. So 80-20 is how you're going to guarantee never lose money. And if you properly set up your entire funnel, to maximize every single click as it comes in. There are so many ways that you can make money outside of a day one click and sale if you know and understand your funnel properly. Okay, so how to groom your campaigns. Again, people are seeing your ads. I, I referenced my client a minute ago in the mass space, right? People are seeing your ads. If they're not selling and they're not buying your product, that means we're not doing a good job selling to them. What's great is in most cases, if we have a 5% conversion rate, we are absolutely ecstatic about our conversion rates. That means we failed 95% of our time and we're still happy with the campaign. How can we fail less often? How can we go from 95 to 90 to 75? And we're gonna see our, you know, our revenues and our margins grow exponentially once we can start to solve that question. So here's my understanding of how most of my clients thought the native ad funnel is gonna work. They've got their ad, then the landing page to their offer page and then the conversion, right? And they try to make multiple changes throughout this funnel to get more out of the bottom of the funnel. So maybe they try different ads or different landing pages or different adjustments and they make you know impactful measurements to increase their conversion rates and make more money for their clients. This is fine. And this is a way you can take a native campaign and be profitable with it. But in my opinion, it's not the best way to run a native funnel. This is what my native funnel looks like. I still have my ad, I still have my landing page, I still have my offer page, and I still have my conversion. However, I am dropping remarketing pixels on people's pages. I'm dropping push notifications on people's pages. I'm helping to increase my social media reach. I'm collecting email addresses. I'm focusing on branded search. I'm boosting up my YouTube views. I'm boosting up my audiences. I'm getting more people on Amazon. This is how a campaign can go from being marginally profitable to exponentially profitable. I've got clients that we may lose money on up front, but we are making so much additional love of them downstream and all these other um, audiences that they want the traffic more so than ever before. So again, how are we gonna properly monetize every single click as it comes in? If all you care about is I wanna spend $100 today and make 105, you could be successful doing that, but you're not gonna be fully successful if you're not you know, monetizing every click. So we covered this, but push notifications, email submits, audience targeting, branded search is so big. And I'll stop and cover this for a second, but if you're selling an e-commerce based product and someone reads a content piece about, you know, your hearing aid, for example, the first thing they're probably going to do is go to Google and type that product in. 
if you're not showing number one for branded search for your product, then you're giving away sales to other people. It's super critical, it's super important. We've seen a 20% lift in branded search by having a healthy native campaign. We're also building up our Facebook audiences, right? Again, remarketing audiences, building up our page likes, our page engagements. All these are gonna help the campaign be much more profitable. Think outside those day one conversions. We talk about this again in great detail. I think it's so important. It's not gonna perform like searches, right? People are not looking for your product. You're putting their product in front of them. It's not gonna perform like Facebook, but it is gonna boost those campaigns up in a very, very big way. So focus outside of day one, look at things as a whole, look at native as one part of your ecosystem, and I guarantee you you're gonna be much happier with the results. All right, this is, we're getting close to the end here, but this is a campaign I like to call, or a slide I like to call, how can you lose money at native marketing, right? All the things that I've done a million times, but you don't wanna do to be profitable, right? Uh, number one is lack of strategy. You're just throwing some ads out there, you're picking a network, and you're just not really caring about how you're researching or how you're setting your campaigns up. We call this spray and pray. Um, thoroughly research and think out your campaigns before you go live. Point two, stop stealing from your competitors. If you're gonna mimic their entire funnel and try to outbid them, they're going to beat you every single time. They've been there, they know what's happening with those campaigns. You can't come in and bid 10 cents more and expect to beat them out from a competitive standpoint. In proper campaign setup, are you mixing mobile and desktop together? Are you mixing all of your browsers together? Are you mixing a thousand different ads together in one campaign? All these little things that'll pile up to make your campaigns unprofitable. Waiting too long to make decisions. I mean, I don't know how many times in my career I've let a site go way too long. If it's not working, cut it, cut it early, get a campaign up and get it profitable. And then you can go back and test that campaign to that site at a later point in time. Not focusing on the details, not being innovative. Again, think outside the box and try to be different from your competitors. You know, be the person that they're gonna chase your ads. Um, being too stubborn. I don't know how many times as well I've looked at a campaign that I think I can make work on this site no matter what, when I should just walk away and try something different. Getting lazy. Um, we all get lazy at times in our campaigns. We see it making a, a solid margin, so we kind of turn away from it, right? Still be innovative, still be thinking, how can you get that campaign up to that next level? And this is probably my most worst campaign I've ever done in my life is messing with a profitable campaign. If something is working, if something is making you money, if something is scaling, don't put new ads in there. Don't pause any ads in there. Adjust your bids and that's it. And then do any new creative testing in a separate campaign. So here's our helpful tips. Um, this is gonna be the last slide, then we'll do some Q&A. Again, these are most of the points we've already covered. We're gonna hit them one more time. I do you think they're important? Um, thoroughly research your ad. Pay attention to your copywriting and your content. A general rule of thumb is on your ad, your images get the highest CTR, your headlines get your conversions. So you have to find a good balance between the two. You know, find what we call your God image. And the God image is, I actually took that from a client of mine, but a God image is an image that just clicks and converts like nothing else out there. Once you find that image, scaling your campaigns can be very, 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 very quick. Make quick cuts. If it's not working, just kill it. Be innovative and don't be greedy. And again, do not touch a working campaign. If something is up, if something is profitable, leave it alone, don't touch it, and you know, look for tests to get new campaigns. So again, thank you for this, I appreciate it. I know I covered a lot in, in 35 minutes and I talk fairly quickly, so I do apologize. I just didn't wanna you know, drag this out too long or run over on things. So please, questions, comments, concerns, I'd love to hear them. And um, again, thank you for the TS team for having me on board. I look forward to, you know, seeing everybody again real soon. And, and thank you for everything. Thank you so much, Joe. What a great kind of, I, I love the, uh, some of the phrases you came out with, spray and, and pray. <laughs> I won't be doing that, spray and pray. Uh, but also some of the tips, how to lose money. Um, yeah, really, really interesting. Can you give me an example of, of kind of a client or somebody you've helped turn things around? Because I think it's really interesting just to put some of this into context. So is there a sort of case study you can talk us through? Yeah, I mean, it's happened a lot of times, right? Um, being an agency and not a peer affiliate, a lot of times people come to us that have tried native and they just didn't make it work, right? And they say, look, we spent X amount of dollars, it wasn't profitable and we're good, you know, we're frustrated, right? Um, we've got a large client in the 
retirement income space that came to us at about seven months ago. And we had a small little 10K test budget. And they said, look, we tried it. We went through a different agency. They couldn't figure it out. Um, we sit here seven months later with, you know, about a quarter million dollar a month budget with those guys. And they love our traffic. It's their CPLs crushing anything else they're doing. And then more importantly, they're seeing those leads convert well in the back end. So um, we got a hundred stories like that. Cause again, people do come to us as a last resort sometimes. Uh, and we've obviously just been through an interesting period the past 18 months. How has COVID impacted your business, but also your clients? Uh, are you seeing new opportunities? Have there been some changes or, or is it just kind of all on an upward trajectory? Oh, massive. I mean, quite honestly, you know, the first two weeks of COVID, I thought I was going to close the doors on my business. You know, we saw massive amounts of traffic and really poor conversion rates. And I just didn't know what to make of it. Right. Um, and then what had happened is basically so many more people were home and on their computers that the inventory went through the roof. Um, the conversion rates didn't match that. But since it's auction based bidding, things began to level out. And we actually had, you know, one of our most profitable years ever, even despite the pandemic. Um, that being said, different offers came and went. Things that were maybe a big offer in 2019 were no longer relevant. And things that were not, you know, even an offer to consider in 2019 became very big. So it's really adapting to what their needs are in the world and then serving ads to kind of, you know, meet those needs. You covered it a little bit in your presentation, but if you imagine somebody's coming to you for the first time, so I'm coming to you, what kind of decisions are you asking me to make and where are you placing the bets? Yeah. So, I mean, first and foremost, want to learn about your product, right? You know, what are you looking to advertise? Is it a, you know, a lead you're looking for the sale of a physical good, you know, and, and what, who is that audience for that good? Once we know that we develop content around that to sell to that need and to that audience. Um, the story is critical because obviously we talked about it, but this is a first touch, right? We're just popping an ad in front of somebody as they're checking the sports scores or as they're looking at their financial statements. So um, they're not in that active buying mode like they are. They're typing your product into Google. So um, again, first and foremost, understanding your product, understanding what the needs are behind that product. Um, I've got a couple of questions here as well. So um, do you feel native can be used in a similar way to PR for large corporations and brands? hundred um, percent. We do some of this already um, in the financial space or in the, just in the peer PR space where you can really spin out a great content piece and then push it out to the audience that you want to advertise for. Um, I've seen this done for everything from honestly brand enhancement, reputation management, right up to high end, you know, brand building. So 100%. Uh, and a second question here, which uh, geographies do you see the most opportunity in over the next three years? Yeah, I mean, so obviously major English speaking is where, you know, my business has primarily been built out of and mostly U.S., but the rates continue to get more and more aggressive as more and more people adopt a native rate. Facebook is getting harder. You know, Google is getting more expensive. So people are shifting to new platforms. Um, I think English speaking outside the major jails is a huge opportunity um, and then non-English speaking as well. You know, I, I said at my presentation, but one of my main goals is to take my 20 percent foreign traffic and boost that to 40, 60 percent over the next three or four years. Um, the bids are so much lower. The audiences are so you know engaged with the content still that you can really do massive, massive volume in those geos. Um, what do you see in the next 18 months to two years? So we talked about COVID in the past 18 months. What are you going to see kind of, or what do you think the future holds uh, for this space? I think it's going to continue to grow. Um, it's been on a steady growth for the past 15 years. I don't see it slowing down, to be honest with you. Um, I think more and more people are starting to shy away from Facebook and from other sources of media just because A, compliance, B, rates, C, you know, whatever other internal reasons they have. And I think as more and more branded type advertisers embrace how powerful native can be for their bottom lines, we're going to see it grow exponentially. Um, I think it's going to, if not completely, almost fully replace display marketing by 2025. I mean, it's basically done so already. Um, when's the last time I bought a 300 by 250 on a CPM from a new site? It's been you know 10 years or more. So um, I think you're going to see it really be the premier displayed platform in the, in the, in the world. Well, Joe, that's all we've got time for in this session. But thank you so much for taking us through everything. And for those of you who are watching, you can watch this session back on YouTube, Facebook, Umbrella as well. Uh, Joe, how do people get hold of you if they want to connect? 
If you want to talk to me, um, you can do a couple things. You know, one, go right to our website, ROIMarketplace.com. Um, we also run a native group called Native Advertising Gurus on Facebook. Feel free to sign up for there, ask questions. You know, there's a lot of great marketers in the world that are you know better than I am at what I do, and they just share great content and great concepts. So if you're not in that group, I highly recommend you sign up for it. Fantastic. Uh, well, we'll be back uh, top of the hour. Let me just check what the next session is. It's emerging markets upscaling in Latin America. So if you're interested in Latin America, that's what we'll be covering in about 20 minutes time. So thank you, Joe. Thanks for watching and we'll see you soon. In the past 10 years, Track Revenue has been working hand-in-hand -hand with affiliates. We feel blessed to have thousands of brand ambassadors across the world that proudly promote both Crack Revenue and our most profitable brands. Because of this, we want to help them succeed by doing everything we can, from dedicated affiliate managers to 24-7 live chat support to newsletters and blogs packed with insight and expert advice. We also update our Crack Revenue platform on a monthly basis, providing more tools, more features, and more creative content for affiliates to use. Not only do we want affiliates to follow the whale, but become one as well.